Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. I'm excited. Today we have Jason Gaynor, the author of Mastermind Dinners, Build Lifelong Relationships by Connecting Experts, Influencers, and Lynchpins. He's the founder of Mastermind Talks, which is one of the world's most exclusive events for entrepreneurs. His invite-only event brings together brilliant minds like multiple New York Times bestseller Tim Ferriss, fashion titan Mark Echo, and so many more. Jason, thanks for joining me. Dude, thank you for having me on. I, I was thinking about afterwards. We're doing video. I should have had some books, like product placement, along the back wall there. But uh, I, no. I missed. Uh, I missed out on that. It looks good. I like the brick, the solid <laughs> brick. And you it's know, well, I'm excited to talk about. You know, I've listened to Mastermind Dinners uh, three times, and um, you know, that could be a record. No, I don't know about that. But consuming <laughs> a lot of the the information, what I wanted to hear about is some specific great stories from these dinners. Sure. And so that's what I wanted to talk to you about. And I wanted to go through the first dinner yep. and then contrast that to the New York <clears throat> time or the, the New York dinner you did with 33 yep. people and then talk about what you're doing lately with Austin. Yeah. And so talk about first, I want to go through your thought process with the first dinner, choosing right. the guest list, the thought process behind the guests and reaching out. So I did some things that were good on that yeah. first dinner and I did some things that were not so good. Yeah. Um, the, approach i guess i didn't have a network at the time yeah. uh really i mean at least locally that was the one thing is i attended a lot of events so i had um i guess contacts and friends scattered throughout the world but in my own city which is toronto uh, i didn't have a strong network so actually one of the core drivers for doing dinners locally uh was to kind of strengthen my relationships down here as far as how i started to uh i guess uh make a guest list of people for the first dinner. I actually, locally, they had, uh, or nationally, there's a new um, magazine publication of like the top 500 businesses um, across the country. Mm -hmm. And I literally went through the list and identified everybody who was in my city uh, and reached out to them all individually cold. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I, I mean, I don't remember exactly what the response rate was. Well, what was, did you What did you decide to do? Because I know you have some great ways of reaching out. You send videos. I did back you, then. <laughs> so what did you do then? Yeah. Uh, the, back then really was just a cold email. I can actually probably pull it up. Mm -hmm. um, but I, it was just really an email saying I'm hosting a dinner with other people. I was trying to leverage the celebrity of uh, the rankings. So I'm like, I'm holding, because uh, this was basically a ranking of the top 500 entrepreneurs or top 500 businesses. Mm -hmm. So I said, uh, in the outreach, I said, I'm, I'm holding a dinner for, um, you know, the, the top entrepreneurs from this magazine yeah. in this and in, in Toronto on such and such a day, would you be interested in joining? And I thought um, being able to leverage that there'd be other kind of like-minded individuals from the list there uh, that would help. And it probably did. But regardless, it was it was tough. I mean, I think from a response rate perspective, I was lucky if I got like a five percent response rate mm -hmm. um, in the outreach because I myself wasn't well known. My dinners, I didn't do dinners prior to that, so I didn't have any brand equity there. Um, so that outreach, and then also, I uh, I had probably two people I knew uh, already out of the eight. I had eight people in attendance. Um, so the, the other six were people I got from, from the magazine. Mm -hmm. Uh, and like I said, out of those six people, I probably reached out to 40, yeah. uh, and had some people cancel last minute and that kind of stuff. But well, there was eight of us, uh, the evening mm -hmm. of my first dinner. Yeah. Yeah. And I want to find out how you choose the, the place. And one thing, um, in the book that you talk about, which has actually changed how I reach out to people is I used to be very specific um, about the time, you know, here's the schedule if you want to schedule. And now I don't do that. I just send, are you interested? And you yeah. make a point of this in the book is, you know, just get that just one question. Don't make them commit to too much. Exactly. This is the, this is the whole kind of philosophy of small wins. Once you get that first small win, it's easier to build on that. And should you have an objection later on, you know exactly what the objection mm -hmm. is about. It's not about you. It's about the time or it's about the location of the restaurant or it's mm -hmm. whatever the case may be. Um, and also even from a commitment perspective, as far as response, if it's a long drawn out email with all different types of details and specifics, it naturally just unconsciously, they feel like the response needs to be a long drawn out kind right. of response. I feel like that when I get long emails and they just go on the back burner for me. Right. But if it's small and quick, if you email the big guys like Seth Godin and Gary V, the guys who actually reply to your emails, it's always like a one or two word <laughs> answer type thing. 
So basically leveraging that small win um, philosophy and then just get, again, small commitments yeah. uh, that kind of elicit really quick responses and then build off of that. Yeah. So were you doing that at the time or did you just... No. Just, no. no. <laughs> again, this is something I learned the hard yeah. way. Um, it's some... Uh, I. I basically kind of laid it all out initially. I said, you know, this is who the dinner's for. This is where it's taking place. Um, this is the time. This is who I am. That kind of stuff. So it was yeah. a kind of a, a long, yeah. professional-looking email. Yeah. Um, but uh, why yeah. did people say no? So you have eight people. There, there were, you said you got five percent response rate. What were some of the oh, yeah. the no's? Why were they saying it? Uh, I just didn't know who I was. I mean, those who didn't respond, I had no clue who I was because it was cold outreach. Yeah. And I, I thought about it. Even like I, great marketers have the ability to put themselves in the shoes of their prospects, right? And I did all this outreach initially, and then I put myself in the shoes of the people I was reaching out to. And I'm like, would I even respond to an email like this? Like somebody reaching out to me completely cold, saying I'm hosting a dinner. Um, you know, just, and I, obviously as entrepreneurs, the most, our most kind of, pro, uh, uh, I guess our biggest asset is our time, right. And how we use it and right. utilize it. Um, so I'm asking for people's, people's time in this case, yeah. uh, which is, you know, not an easy proposition. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I totally understand why a lot of people, A, didn't get back to me and why a lot of people, you know, didn't end up, uh, you know, replying in the first place and, and saying that they couldn't attend. But, uh, what makes it easier now is I've done enough that I have mm -hmm. enough brand momentum and right. stuff like that. That yeah, that's what I'm talking at the beginning because people can relate to that and they sure, may be exactly. starting. Yeah, yeah. So when people did respond, you got to know what were some of the common reasons. Uh, just scheduling, scheduling. whether it was so true time. or not. Uh, yeah. nobody knows, right? But mm -hmm. a lot of, I mean, that's the kind of the easy way out is just to say I'm busy with something yeah. else, and they could have been uh, or maybe not. I mean, I know some that. To, to their credit, I mean, I know some entrepreneurs, my own schedule, I have stuff booked in October, right? So like seven months away from now, right? So, right. Uh, you know, we're usually pretty, pretty scheduled yeah. far out. So I think I was reaching out on maybe like two, three weeks notice. Yeah. Um, so you definitely ran into some schedule conflicts. So what about the restaurant? How'd you choose a restaurant? Tell me about negotiating with the restaurant. Uh, so I did it at, in a private room, mm -hmm. um, which turned out to be fantastic. I didn't know exactly I didn't have a kind of a thought process behind mm. it initially. Um, when I, I I picked the restaurant, um, I wanted it to, to be somewhere nice, somewhere private. It was actually in a private club, which was a nice kind of feel to it because if they weren't a member, it was kind of like this exclusivity thing, mm -hmm. uh, which was nice. Um, and also variety of food. That's a big thing as well. A lot of people don't pay attention to that. Um, just given you know what I've done with Mastermind Talks and stuff like, not, like that, I know a lot of people are – in our audience are very health conscious, very much into paleo and vegetarians and that kind of stuff. Right. So when picking a restaurant, being very, very conscious of that. So that that particular restaurant had a pretty good um, menu selection. And I felt like should I – I was only look, doing the one dinner. I was not looking past it. But afterwards, I mean, it, I wanted to kind of create a relationship with one or two restaurants in the city. Right. And that was just a, a natural kind of fit. What are some mistakes that you've made with dealing with restaurants that people should avoid or asking certain questions that you didn't think of until you started doing a lot of these? Um, I think, uh, I think the, 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 well, going there in advance um, and really hand selecting the table you want. If it's not going to be a private room, mm. I, I don't think I've ever done a dinner where I haven't seen the venue in advance. Um, and I, for example, I held an, a dinner in Toronto recently for 25 people. Yeah. And it's an, it took, I live about an hour and a half outside of Toronto. I drove all the way to the city just to see the, dinner, the, the restaurant a week before mm -hmm. um, our dinner. Um, and to see exactly where people will be sitting, how loud is the music, all that kind of stuff. Because to me, that, that stuff really matters. Mm -hmm. So um, seeing a restaurant in advance and so that there's no surprises is a big thing. Showing up in advance as well. I traditionally show up at least an hour in advance, oftentimes, even if I know exactly where we're sitting and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, that that's that's a big thing as well. Uh, the food. One thing I actually started doing recently, um, which was it actually worked out really really well. This was actually my wife's idea. Uh, we held a all the good ideas come from you, the wife. They do. They do. <laughs> Trust me, she's my better half. Um, we actually, uh, so I held a retreat in the Bahamas, uh, for 33 people. And, uh, so we had to orchestrate, you know, eating out at restaurants and that kind of stuff. And when you get everybody seated, seated down with menus and stuff like that, it's uh it's a long process to, yeah. for them to take time to order. And I learned this in the first dinner, 
you know, we people got into conversation. It was 45 minutes into the dinner and we still haven't ordered. Mm -hmm. So that was a mistake I made initially. What I did actually at my last dinner, which had 25 people, I pre-ordered for everybody. I just ordered, uh, you know, shareable platters and stuff like mm. that. And uh, I got that from my wife who uh, did, we did it in the Bahamas when we were there for an entire week. We were hosting 33 people. And it actually cuts the cost down significantly as well. So not only is it a better uh, experience, because literally the people who came to my last dinner in Toronto, they showed up at 7 o'clock. At 7.15, food just started coming out. Mm. Um, and it just worked out great. Yeah. Again, financially, it was it was more – it was better uh, as well. Um, and that's something I've, I've learned along the way because our first dinner, the mistake I made was – giving everybody a menu in advance. And you could still do the menu stuff, but you also have to set the tone at the beginning of the dinner yeah. that you know you want everybody to look at the menu and order right away and make sure you kind of orchestrate with that, that with the server because it can keep on dragging on pretty quickly. Yeah. And so Jason, with the first one, everyone shows up. Is there any specific follow-up that you did before? And then when they get there, I want to hear about some of the introductions, how you kind of mesh people together. I was nervous as sin at that first dinner, but uh, as far as the the lead up, uh, I didn't really do anything outside of once I got there. Okay, um, I followed up the day before, I think, with a reminder mm -hmm. with uh, my with a reminder, and then the day of with my cell phone number. Should they have any questions or be late or whatever the case may be. Mm -hmm. um, and then as far as afterwards, I think I just sent a thank you email, and that was pretty much yeah. the the end of my communication. Mm -hmm. Now I'm kind of much. I put. Uh, a little more into it, like I have a, a shared Google Calendar where I don't um, share those who are attending. That's one thing I keep it blind. Um, and there's several reasons for that. Um, and then uh, communication-wise, now I'll usually do a follow-up afterwards with some key points from from the dinner and the discussion. Uh, as far as some, I guess, mistake from a introduction perspective of the first dinner, I uh, again very nervous, <laughs> but uh, and I think you get confidence through through taking action, right? But after you do a few of these dinners, you get confidence, you get clarity. Yeah. Um, you smooth so out some of the kinks. Exactly. Yeah. They get significantly easier. I just remember my first dinner yeah. when people started talking, I was kind of sitting back and I was like, I don't want to interrupt and that kind of stuff. Now I'm much more in a position where I, I you know, take charge and tell people just hold on a sec. We just got to do this, this housekeeping stuff for these introductions and, and yeah. get them out of the way. Yeah. Um, so that was a, a learning from my first dinner. So then for now, do you actually go around and introduce each person. What's your format for that? So uh, <laughs> I talk about it in the book. I don't remember exactly how I laid it out in the book, but it depends on the size of the group yeah. um, and how much time you want to yeah. devote to it. So normally I, I like to open, uh, well, thanking everybody, telling everybody why they're there. So my relationship with everybody individually. So I'll say, you know, I know Jeremy because of X, Y, Z, and this mm -hmm. is why he's here. I know Joey because X, Y, Z, and this is why he's here. And go around. It's yeah. great to give context that way. Yeah. Then after that, we'll go into uh, introductions, which normally look along the lines of normally we don't. I do seating. Uh, uh, last few dinners, I've done uh, assigned seating. Yeah, um, that's something I didn't do initially. I, yeah, no, I, I didn't do that initially actually. So this is something I started doing recently, mm -hmm. um, and that works great as well. But usually, introductions would be like your name, um, your top business achievement, top personal achievement, um, and uh, one of, one of the mastermind talks icebreaker cards. Uh, and then usually the conversation starts flowing from there pretty naturally. Uh, and there may be some, depending on the group size, there may be some facilitation needed. But uh, usually the conversation just starts picking up from there. What were some fun icebreaker cards? What oh, responses? Um, oh, responses. Uh, oh, God, I don't remember. Because uh, those mean, things do tend to, people start to relate to people. with what, what sort of questions, I guess, is on the icebreaker cards? Uh, when you hear the word successful, who's the first person that comes to mind and why? Mm -hmm. It's so funny because so Tim Tim Ferriss came to our first uh, Mastermind Talks event. We had Mastermind Talks icebreaker cards, and if you listen to the first like six seven episodes of his podcast, all of his questions are from our card deck. Really? And, and uh, yeah, and the question that you know when you think of the word successful, who's the first person that comes to mind and why? He uses that virtually in every episode. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, it's it's funny to see that. Uh, yeah, he, he's running with it, yeah. but. Uh, yeah, I mean, there, there's that question. There's, uh, I removed the tombstone question, like, you know, what do you want it to say on your tombstone or whatever? We, the, the, the thing is, we originally had a list of 150 questions. And it was so hard initially to kind of, you know, 
remove questions. I felt like 150 was too much, but it was really tough. And after doing so many of these dinners, you just realize yeah. some of these questions don't really kickstart a conversation. Yeah, right. Um, so now we have like a core list of 50 questions, and they're f phenomenal. What are and they so, can get yeah. access to that if they go to the mastermindinners.com uh, website. What's one that you thought was going to work really well, and it just didn't stimulate conversation? Oh, boy. Uh I have my cards here somewhere. <laughs> I can look them up. I'm trying to think. Of it. It's uh, uh, one where I, I, I think around like what do you want to be remembered for or something like that. Uh, that's one that usually it's, you know, it's always kind of the same answers. Mm -hmm. um, another one that, that I always have to kind of guide people. And I think that's an indication of a question that's not the greatest right. is um, what's your top personal achievement? Because oftentimes they'll say, I got married to the love of my dreams. I have these beautiful children. And it's kind of like this easy way out. Yeah. And I want to know, like, I sat down with an entrepreneur once. This was probably my fourth or fifth dinner. He was a tech guy, nerdy guy, um, you know, just not somebody you think is, like, I don't know, outdoorsy or anything like that. You just think he's a cubicle <laughs> type guy. Uh, but at the dinner, I asked, we asked, you know, what's your top personal achievement? And he went to canoeing in Alaska for like mm. a month and a half. Wow. And I was like, what? That's bananas. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like <laughs> those are the type of questions I, or those type of answers I want to pull out. So I try to avoid the like the mm -hmm. easy way out like my kids or, or that kind of stuff. Uh, but I'm a firm believer that the quality of your conversations really comes down to the quality of your questions. Yeah. So really kind of honing down those questions is, is a big deal. And like I said, we've kind of done the, the hard part of honing that down to a core yeah. list of 50 which can be found yeah. on the mastermind dinners website yeah so what is one of those questions that you have that maybe surprised you that works the best like as a go-to if things are kind of dry because that was one thing i want to hear about in the actual dinner how do you stimulate that conversation for people um i uh da, 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 da. so the, the, honestly i think probably the one that stands out the most is that question around success mm -hmm. when you hear the word success who's the first person that comes to mind and why because i think it really gives you a clear idea of somebody's model of success yeah. right is it somebody like an elon musk yeah. who does these tremendously big projects and yeah. big vision and that kind of stuff yeah. but doesn't have a great family life yeah. or is it somebody when they say like you know my father yeah. was a great father or whatever so it yeah. gives you a quick insight as to yeah. what somebody values and what somebody yeah. is kind of trying to work towards unconsciously. A lot of people don't realize it. Yeah. So it's a, it's a, it's a good question yeah. in that sense. It's a fantastic. Yeah. And mine is one that you opened your book with the quote. One of my, mine is John Wooden and, uh, Oh yeah. And, uh, that quote in the beginning of your book is yeah. mean, fantastic. Um, so with you know, contrast that, I guess with, uh, now with the, the 33, person dinner um, in <laughs> yeah. New York with best-selling authors who how did you come up with that guest list pro you know and, and invite and what were the responses like um so significantly better to get those people <laughs> to my dinner after I've been doing them for like a year and a half um so that particular dinner I was actually holding a retreat um in uh New York so the retreats are, is part of uh, my mastermind talks program where we where there's 15 of us and I take them all over the place and we do some masterminding and stuff like that and uh when I was doing it in New York I knew we were going to do a group dinner of the 15 of us anyways and I thought you know I might as well kind of supercharge this dinner with some amazing people so right. uh I reached out to um I don't know how many people it was now but basically I, there's 34 people that were supposed to be at the, the dinner or that I invited per se uh, and 33 showed up. The only one who wasn't able to make it was Ramit Sethi. So uh, everybody else, I mean, we just had A.G. Jacobs who's a great friend, he's a four-time New York Times bestselling author. James Altucher has a great podcast and is a Wall Street Journal bestselling author, his lovely wife. Um, a good friend of mine named Dan Dapani who was a, a monk for 10 years and now oh. kind of teaches entrepreneurs at meditation and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, just an overall, just a great group. Um, a, a good friend, Jeffrey, who owns a, co-owns a... Uh, restaurant chain called witchcraft which they're growing like mad they have some like 30 40 locations right now um so yeah it, it's uh, it was very different significantly larger than i'd like uh but thankfully we were able to find a, a venue that was completely private yeah where we went into the basement it was you know we filled up the room and so it was it was it was big but it was still very intimate i did assigned seating in a group that size you have to do assigned seating you can't leave kind of serendipity to chance as far mm -hmm. as you know conversation and stuff like that so um we i did assigned seating for that one yeah so what was and, some of the thought process of who you had sit next to who um 
I just, yeah, it, it, it's tough. I, I, like, I just kind of follow my gut intuition now yeah. as far as like, who are two people who would probably really enjoy each other. Mm -hmm. And it's a mix of, <laughs> there's a lot of thought process unconsciously that goes into it. Yeah. Um, and you get better at this along the way. Like if you know somebody is not, is a little kind of self-conscious and is not super extrovert, then I'll sit them on one side next to somebody they know really, really well so that they're comfortable and across from somebody they should know. Um, and stuff like that. So mm. there's there's quite a bit of thought process right. in that sense. But at the end of the day, it's, you know, who do you think they'll, will kind of really hit it off? Mm -hmm. uh, and it's a balance of reconnecting with existing ties. So sitting them next to somebody they already know versus getting them to sit next to a complete stranger who, you know, yeah. they may be a best friends in the future. Yeah. So tell me one that was spot on that when you check back with them like six months or a year later, they were actually doing a deal together or they were doing something <clears throat> together or maybe they were going vacationing with their families together. <laughs> what? Uh, James Altucher and AJ Jacobs. So uh, they, so this is in the sense of a connection, not necessarily in the dinner setting, but if I sat them across from each other at a dinner, it would be the exact same thing. Mm -hmm. And actually at that dinner, I sat them next to each other because I knew it was a while since they saw each other and they become ridiculously close friends. Mm -hmm. But at the first Mastermind Talks event, I was... Um, I think James Altucher Altuch just got off the stage and AJ Jacobs was there. And I, I asked AJ, I'm like, because they're both based in New York. Yeah. I asked AJ, I'm like, do you know James? And he's like, no. And I'm like, I was like, you guys are like long lost brothers. Like, Why you guys did you say that? To... What made you think that? that just, it, I don't know. Honestly, like I, there's some people I connect and this is not woo woo or anything. I, there's some people I connect just based on energy. Like I know their energy is on the same level. Mm -hmm. I can't explain it. Um, but they're like, as far as James and AJ, they're, they're just both like kind of nerdy and quirky and like funny. And just, I just had a natural inclination. I'm like, yeah. I can't believe you guys don't know each other. Right. Like it makes no sense. Yeah. So I introduced them uh, at the event and, uh, They've become incredibly close close friends. AJ found out through 23andMe that uh, James is a distant cousin, and so they refer to each other as, as, <laughs> as cousins now. Um, they hold, they do these things after the event they were doing, and they're still doing them. Uh, Skype lunches together, so they'll both order in food or whatever and eat with video Skype. Um, yeah, they've become really, really close friends. And to me, like – that is like the ultimate payoff to mm -hmm. see people connect like that. And, and I, cause I did an actually an interview with, with James and Claudia uh, for the James Altucher mm -hmm, podcast. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was talking about how many people at mastermind talks he's stayed in close touch and close touch with. And oftentimes you forget where you met certain individuals. And he thought he knew AJ further back to mastermind talks when I, I kind of reminded him that <laughs> that's where they actually met. Okay. Um, so yeah. they are long lost kindred souls, I guess. Oh, trust yeah. me. I, to, it's on my bucket list to spend the day with both of them. It would probably be the, like the best day of my life because <laughs> they're, yeah, they're a blast. So what's another one like that that you connected and that they became good friends or? I mean, it happens a lot. I mean, I have another one, Clay A. Bear, uh, who we were actually just talking about offline uh, and Matt Kepnis, who uh, has a website called Nomadic Matt. They met a mastermind talks and uh, I mean, they're, they're, they go out for dinner together. They yeah. become really close friends. Um, there's a lot of people like that. Yeah. So. I ask because you have this intu you know, this intuition, this sense. And so I'm trying to break down what it but is, it's what it is yeah, you're it's, seeing. It, that I mean, that's the, one of the core reasons why I want to get on a on a call with you or an interview yeah. is because I know you're one of the best interviewers I know. Thank you very a much. A lot of this stuff is unconscious for me. Right. Right. And I'm like, if it's anybody's like able to yeah. 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 So if anything's going to be able to kind of, anybody's going to be able to pull it out of me, it's, it's probably you. It's probably not going to be easy, but <laughs> it's going to be you. So, yeah, that's why I'm asking. So what was the, the connection that you saw, I guess, that when people said, you know, you look at it from the, the observer, it seems like a weird match or that they wouldn't fit together. Uh, you saw something. So there's some that I thought wouldn't work, yeah. but did. Yeah. Uh, like Dan Dapani and Tim Ferriss, I didn't think they'd hit it. Like I didn't. I didn't think they'd hit it off. Uh, Tim Ferriss is obviously well known for his four-hour work week. Dan Dapani was a monk for ten years, um, and uh, you know talked about meditation and the importance of like stillness at mastermind talks and stuff like that. And um, they ended up talking, and Tim gave uh, Dan Dapani a shout out like three, four days later saying, you know, for the first time in my life, I'm making my bed or something. And that was in relation to like the whole meditation and yeah. starting the day right and that kind of stuff. Yeah. And I didn't see that one coming. Um, but, you know, <laughs> when you create an environment and put these people in a room, you, you never know. Mm -hmm. um, 
So, yeah, I mean, that's an example of one. I, I haven't had any kind. I've had one go bad, um, but it wasn't really inside my control. Um, it was just somebody was having a bad day and it just turned out to be a bad connect in, mm -hmm. in that in that sense. Um, but, I mean, really, it's it's when you have amazing people, it's it's pretty easy to connect them. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and I talk about it in the book, the, the power of uncommon commonalities. That's kind of one yes. of the biggest thing is is being amazing is is an uncommon commonality there's a lot of mediocre average people out there so we just put amazing people in a room uh it makes it pretty easy to yeah. kind of build deep connections so how do you get over i think for the person starting because you can go to the advanced person or the person starting um how do you get over that nervousness like you say you still get nervous not as much but oh, but yeah. how do you get over that i yeah i get terribly nervous because yeah. i care so much about those who you know come out to to the dinners yeah in the um, beginning how do you still uh you know keep yourself from shutting it down because you're so nervous and then later on well, I, om I almost can't i talk about it all the time i almost canceled the first one two hours prior because i'm like nobody's gonna see value in this gonna think i wasted their time right but again i can't like stress enough like the importance of if you, if you take action that's the easiest way to get confidence and clarity so um yeah, one thing you could do actually i had a, a clarity phone call uh with somebody right before this call who want to get into the event space and stuff like that. And I said, if you were to do it all over again, how would you do it? And I, I told them pretty much along the same lines of what we talked about earlier, like small commitments, small like bite-sized commitments and built off mm -hmm. that. It starts small. Instead of doing uh, focusing on building a big event, start on just doing something small, like a small experience for eight people, like a cooking class or mm -hmm. uh, a dinner or something like that. And then from there, you'll get clarity as exactly how you want to do it. And you'll be building confidence along the way. So they are getting significantly easier from a confidence perspective. Um, I think the first one, you just need to jump in. One thing that would help alleviate some of that confidence you know, uh, issues would be uh, to partner with somebody. Ramit Sethi and Michael Fishman um, did a dinner series in New York City for two years. They did once a month. Michael would invite three people that Ramit didn't know. Ram, mm -hmm. uh, Ramit would invite people that Michael didn't know, and they'd do this 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 dinner, and they'd both split the the tab, uh, and it was it was easy uh, yeah. from that perspective. I, yeah. I was at one of those dinners you know, two years ago, and it was great. So that's a, a, a way to do it is to partner with somebody. And one one thing I thought about, I've never done to date, was to um, do a dinner with a group of people, and then selecting one person in the group to kind of co-host a future dinner and mm -hmm. continue. And that would be an easy way to grow my network because I invite three pre people. He'll probably invite three people that who I, you know, I don't know who they are yeah. and we'll have a great dinner because of it. So, um, yeah, that's a that's one way to kind of overcome that that confidence, but it definitely does get easier over time. Mm -hmm. What are some of the crises that you diverted? What comes to um, mind from throughout your years of doing this? Honestly, I think the one of the main ones was um, the – the first dinner where, sorry, I had uh, one gentleman. So I had uh, two people on one side of the table that were very tech oriented. One guy was in like wearable technology and the other guy was like a high level DJ who had this like crazy program or whatever. So they were talking about tech, uh, the entire, like for a good portion of the dinner. And yeah. on the flip side, all the way at the other end of the table, there was a guy who had owned a moving company. And so they like complete opposite spectrums of like the business world, right? So I was like, damn, this guy's like quiet the entire dinner and, mm -hmm. you know, said a few things here and there, but really wasn't engaged like uh, around like the technology conversation. So I ended up, um, after it was kind of going for a bit, I ended up asking the, the, the guy who owned the, the moving company, something about his business. I forget what it was. Um, like, you know, in order for your business to jump to the next level, what's something you need to overcome or solve or something that's another great question i like to ask people and uh he started talking about it and he talked about being on a show similar to shark tank it's called dragons den in canada yeah, sure yeah i've seen and it yeah he was going on the show or something like that um and was just trying to think of how to like position it and uh the two guys who were so involved with technology got so excited about this guy's moving business and they were giving him like ideas on how to market and stuff like that so it became very clear to me that no matter what business you're in no matter what industry you're in we all face similar pains as entrepreneurs mm -hmm. you know uh, raising capital managing employees all that kind of stuff doesn't matter what business you're in yeah. it's all the same um so uh, that was i guess a little bit of a crisis that i diverted to some degree that's I mean, a big one a good time, because if you're but, hosting people that's a huge question of how do you engage everyone to make sure yeah. everyone's having a good time? 
Well, yeah, and I, I think that's one of the, I guess, my unique abilities to some degree is to be able to, I don't know if it's empathy, but put myself in their shoes and say, you know, if, if I was him right now, how would I be feeling? Like, watch body language and stuff like that. Like, yeah. you know, would I want the host to come in and say, you know, get me into the conversation or, or whatever the case may be? So yeah. I'm very conscious of, like, energy and body language, and I'm very observant. Like, I, that dinner I just did in Toronto for 25 people, I, I, it's, it's not uncommon that I don't sit down at my dinners or I don't eat. Like yeah. I literally am walking around, make sure everybody's talking, make sure, you know, pushing conversation here and there. Um, and I let everything happen organically, but yeah. I'm very, very observant. Yeah. yeah. So what did you do at the Toronto or what did you see at the Toronto dinner where you had to kind of step in or, you know, be on, on point? Hey, yeah. Toronto one went uh, easy <laughs> because I, I had assigned seating and it was just a great group of individuals. Uh, I mean, for the first half of the dinner, I was kind of Again, standing there and watching everybody. Um, again, just to see, you know, are people, everybody talking? Is everybody seem like they're meshing? How's body language and that kind of stuff? And then after a while, I got comfortable enough and I sat down at my own table. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, the Toronto one was was significantly easier. But the quality of it, no, the quality, just like Mastermind talks, the quality of your dinner really comes down to the quality of people that you have for dinner. Right. So yeah. So going from that first dinner to the New York dinner. Yeah. What are the, your other favorite stories from that New York dinner that people should know, whether it's crisis wise or success wise? Um, there is. Yeah, I mean, I, I, the importance of, of, of venue selection, of restaurant selection, we spent easily eight, nine hours trying to find this restaurant. And this is New York City. There's a lot of restaurants in New York City. Right. Um, but to find like the perfect place uh, was, and I actually, that was one restaurant I wasn't able to visit firsthand, but I sent my assistant <laughs> to see it firsthand. So uh, again, it's really, really important. And uh, even if you can't see it firsthand, it's in another city. Um, I'm doing, for mastermind dinners, I'm doing something where I know I can't be there to see the venues. Um, so I'm sending a personal concierge at 40 bucks an hour to literally walk through the venue with a video camera just so I can at least get that. Yeah. Um, so venue selection is, is huge and we really hit it out of the park in New York. And if yeah. you're ever doing one in New York for a group of 30 people, Meatball in Chelsea, phenomenal. And it was, it was yeah, I mean, it was cheap. The food was phenomenal. The space was great. They were great. Highly nice. recommend. I wish I could hold all my dinners there. So what about Austin? Tell me about the thought process. You're going to be holding one in Austin soon. I am. So I was, <clears throat> we were just talking about it offline. Like I was, uh, I mean, I have a pretty good network in Austin, but I like to reconnect with old ties and also yeah. connect with, with new people. So I have a mix at yeah. my dinners. Um, and uh, I posted it to Facebook and I, I had like 30, it was something like 38 people uh, suggested to me. And these include people like Tucker Max, who's a three at the time New York Times bestselling author, yeah. Ryan Dice, who has a $30 million information product business, like those are some really kind of legit players. And yeah. we kind of joked about it before. I think you, you asked me like, when was the last time you did a dinner of like four to six people? <laughs> and uh, it's been a bit, it's been a long time because it's yeah. like the paradox of choice. I have so many great people coming my way. I try to squeeze them all in. Right. Uh, the one thing is I'm trying to move away from dinners. Um, there's a, a few people who are starting to do dinners as well now, and there's nothing wrong with dinners. Um, but experiences always, uh, mm -hmm. are better than dinners. So what are you going to do? Uh, so there's two things. So I, for example, in, in Toronto, I've done stuff like ax throwing events with entrepreneurs and cooking classes with entrepreneurs. Okay. And it, it creates a great bond significantly yeah. better than a, a dinner. Um, and dinners are great. I'm not harping on dinners, but ex holding experiences really is the next level of that. Mm. Um, for for Austin, one thing I'm looking at now, I don't know if you've ever seen it. It's This will be the first mastermind dinner we do like this. Um, it's called like a pub crawler bike or something where literally there's like 12 people on a bike I'm and there's one person like riding it, <laughs> driving it or whatever from pub to pub. Um, That's great. And I thought, so this will be like the first like mobile mastermind dinner we do. The only thing is I'm, I'm, I don't like the idea of pubs because not a lot of people in my group are drinkers or heavy drinkers at that. Um, so I'm trying to see if we can do one that's like more like a foodie fine dining mm -hmm. with this bike and going from like location to location to location. So that's what I'm planning. Again, yeah. now I'm looking over and above dinners and how can I make yeah. this an experience because yeah. it creates a, a much stronger bond. A lot more work, but a much stronger yeah. bond. So what other thoughts are going to this Austin dinner that most people won't see? Uh, I, the synergy of the group. Uh, yeah. I mean, that's a big thing. Um, it's, it's tough 
when I don't know everybody on an intimate level, if I know everybody on an intimate level, it's a piece of cake to see yeah. if they're going to be a great fit or not. When I people are suggested to me, um, that's what makes it a little more difficult because you have to start researching. Yeah. Uh, and it's, I've made the mistake in the past of judging somebody's success or quality uh, based on their online profile. Right. Yeah. And I know some pretty big business people who have like yeah. no LinkedIn profile or two LinkedIn contacts. So it's, yeah. I've learned it's not necessarily the best method. Yeah. Uh, so I, I, I think definitely selection in, in, in that process uh, of new people and people I already know is going to be tricky. Um, the size of it, I really want to accommodate 38 people because they're all amazing people. I simply can't yeah. unless I do you know, split up dinners. I was thinking of doing like lunches and dinners uh, to kind of split up the group. Mm -hmm. But uh, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll probably have to keep it significantly smaller. Um, so kind of in that thought process right now is do I do yeah. something big like I did in New York or do I do something smaller and you know, just try to pick the best people, yeah. uh, that kind of stuff. And then I, I even, again, something as simple as doing a, a pub crawl on a bike, I want to take it a level above that because right. I know who my audience is and I know what they value. Right. Uh, and they value good food over over alcohol so for yeah. the most part. So uh, you know, trying to kind of mold that a little bit to fit the group a little better. It's a challenge too because you're not in that city, so that's yeah, a big challenge. It, it, yeah, I mean, it adds a, a bit of a layer of com complexity to it. Um, yeah. Like I said, I'd like to see all the venues, like ninety eight percent of, of restaurants and stuff like that, I see firsthand. Um, but in the worst case, I mean, uh, like I said, in the case of what I'm doing in Napa, you can hire somebody with a video camera to <laughs> to do some of that legwork for you. Yeah. Uh, it's not ideal, but it definitely you know, video gives yeah. you a lot more context than like polished pictures on TripAdvisor or something. So Yeah, I'm really going to have to think deeply about how you're really an, like an entrepreneur matchmaker and what that <laughs> blink is behind what makes you see something that someone's a connection. Um, yeah. And the other thing that I think about, which is hard to do, is now that you become bigger, um, how do you say no? In a, in a, <laughs> yeah. I mean, because you're a nice guy and... How do you say no? Dude, it is a struggle, my friend. Um, you know, there's a great saying that uh, uh, that's we, the difference between successful people and very successful people is that very successful people say no to almost everything. That's a quote by Warren Buffett yeah. out of all people, right? Yeah. So he, he somebody is a great example of that. And that's uh, something I'm getting better at. I don't think it's, yeah. it's something that happens overnight, yeah. um, whether that be people, removing people in, in my life who don't serve me or I can't serve them. Yeah or opportunities, um, you know, the getting clear on really what I'm good at and kind of honing in on that. Um, yeah, I mean, saying no because I, you know, try to be a nice guy, I feel like I am a nice guy, right. it is very difficult. Uh, and my default thing is to please. Um, right. And that lack that, that comes from like uh, a lack of self-worth <laughs> worth as a child, but I'm aware of it. But that's the first thing, I'm always trying to help people, always yeah. trying to be Mr. Nice Guy and that kind of stuff. So that's definitely something I'm uh, I'm struggling with. But it's getting a self-serving question on my point, because I-, I <laughs> You <laughs> I are a nice guy. Thank you. But um, no, but so how did you say no before that you said you're working on it, and then how has it improved? Uh, it's improved because I, I've gotten significantly more clear at where I am, where I want to go. Yeah. Um, and that makes it a lot easier to say no, um, you know, to, to, to different things. I mean, for, for one thing, um, you know, there's a, 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 a story, I forget how the story goes exactly, but it was basically these guys were training for the Olympics or something like that. And they were like a group of four people, I think it was for a rowing team or something. And they made a pact that they'd asked before they make a decision on anything, they'd ask themselves the question, will this make the boat go faster when it comes time to like race day or something mm -hmm, like that? Mm -hmm which is like the importance of understanding like the clear end goal. Um, so I'm apply that in my own, now that I'm kind of clear on where I want to go, yeah. you know, opportunities that come my way for like interviews or something like that. I ask myself, will this make mastermind talks, the event a better experience? And if it's not, then it's, it's a clear no. Yeah. Um, and usually people are pretty respectful. If I answer back, you know, I'm hundred percent focused on mastermind talks right now, reach out to me in May. So I have yeah. like podcast interviews that have been scheduled for the last like eight months. Yeah. Cause I just, you know, I, I postpone them till I really, whatever time kind of works for me. Yeah. So that's, that's, I think having clarity exactly where you are, where you want to go. It's hard to say no when you're just kind of yes. reacting to, to the stimulus of day to day stuff. So yeah, so I could see that if you, people understand, you just tell them what you are focused on and this doesn't yeah. kind of fit into that, that path right now. Yeah, yeah. exactly. 
Yeah, that's a nice way of putting it. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> um, so what about, I know you have a call in a minute or two. Um, yeah, I wanted you to well, talk a little about the fundraiser and charity dinner. Yeah, so I, I, I made this as an update to the to the book. I forgot to include it. Um, and it's something I want to, to kind of, a lot of people ask me how to monetize these dinners and you can monetize them. Mm-hmm. It's easier to monetize experiences because um, it's just easier to kind of, financially to, to put money in there. Yeah. Cause yeah. you're not going to charge $250 a person for a dinner. Um, so, but there is, uh, conversely, a lot of people have asked me about raising money and yeah. charity and stuff like that and fundraisers. And, uh, there was actually a great friend of mine named Jason Atkins. He did a, an event at his house. Tim Ferriss was coming to town for an event. He knew Tim somewhat and reached out to Tim and said, Hey, I'm doing this, this intimate dinner at my house. So, and so, uh, he had another guy who was a big name at the dinner and he said, he's going to be here. Uh, it's in support of, uh, whatever charity was, I forget what it was. Um, would you mind, you know, would you, would you be open to having dinner with us, uh, in support of charity? And, uh, Jim, Tim agreed to it and he sold 20 spots at 500 bucks a person. Uh, so he raised 10 grand. Um, just through holding like a simple dinner at his cells. And it was great from a relationship building perspective because I mean, yeah. it was just, it was a mastermind dinner in essence. Yeah. It was a, a side bonus to it that it supported a charity. And it was an easy yes for Tim because it, it makes him look good, makes him feel good, uh, that kind of stuff. So either A, you can find any celebrity, you can find out what, or entrepreneur, you can find out what organizations they yeah. support, reach out to them and say, you know, I'm looking to hold a charity dinner with you or whatever the case may be, yeah. um, and do something similar. It doesn't have to be 500 bucks. It could be 250 bucks, could be whatever, but uh, it's definitely a good way to, to raise money. Yeah. So what should we leave people with? Start a dinner, do something, <laughs> <laughs> create a community. Really, I mean, yeah. it's it. I, I really, I didn't write the book for for fame or for financial reasons or anything like that. I, I wrote it because I know mastermind dinners or putting connecting people in general yeah. Yeah. Uh, fundamentally changed my life on yeah. every level from yeah. my health, from my relationship with my wife, from my relationship with other people, yeah. Yeah. my finances, my my happiness, overall happiness. Um, so I, I I wrote it for a reason. So I I, I think I laid everything out there. Yeah. Um, I tried to be as transparent as possible with my yeah. wins and my losses, hoping that people would be able to leverage that and do their own dinners. And it doesn't have to be dinners. Could be coffee meetups. Could be experiences. Could yeah. be whatever. But yeah. uh, there's huge value in connecting like-minded individuals in whatever vehicle you choose. Yeah. And I have t- a title for your next book after listening to this one. Um, Power questions that will launch your, I originally had career, but power questions that will launch your life, um, I think should be your next book. Power questions that will launch. I will, because I will. all the questions you ask in, I mean, it's all about questions that you, you have these questions at the mastermind dinners that are stimulating this conversation. You yeah. talk about amazing questions in the actual, in the mastermind dinners book, yeah. like under what circumstances would you say yes? That question yeah. alone I, I mean, that was a game changer for me. Game yeah. changer. And yeah. there's there's many of those in, <laughs> in your Mastermind Dinners book. So it's so, you know, just reaching the unreachable, what's in it for them? Just thinking of the question, what's in it for them? You know, yeah. those things I was pulling out of the book that were just life changing things. Questions are powerful. And I've I've I'm I've been blessed with mentors throughout my life. And the best mentors I've had aren't the ones who gave me the best direct advice. It's the ones who ask the best questions yeah. because that, it leaves, it kind of plants this seed unconsciously or consciously. It just makes you think about different things from different yeah. angles. And, and yeah, I mean, questions are incredibly yeah. powerful. And um, that's why I look at like somebody like Tim, he won a, a fantastic interviewer as well because the quality of his questions, right? Yeah. That's really precise questions that uh, not a lot of people put a lot of emphasis in, in, in I guess, putting effort into questions and I, I definitely think they should. Yeah. So let's, and we try to make it easy with the, with the, with the bonus for the book. So, yeah. So let's point people towards, cause I need to go there to where you have those, all the questions for, you haven't dinner. gone there yet. Oh, I gosh. didn't even know it was there. Yeah. Oh, uh, so it's masterminddinners.com. Mm-hmm. Literally you go in there and you, uh, enter your email address and you'll get emailed a bunch of resources, including all the mastermind dinner icebreaker cards. Icebreaker questions. Yeah. So there's 50 of them and they're, like yeah. I said, they're, they've been weeded down from hundreds. Yes. Uh, so these, these are some great conversation starters that you'll find some online that have never, like I said, 
that you actually try to apply in conversation and you get an answer back and you're like, oh, of course, that's the answer I was going to get. This is a terrible question. Right? Right. So these these questions really Huge. foster great conversation. Yeah. Jason, I know you have to go. Thank you so much. I, Thank you. Know, you fantastic. Man. I appreciate it. Yeah. I'll see you in Napa. I'll see you in Napa. See you, brother. Bye. <laughs>